In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in the name of one God, amen. Dear Lord, we thank you for again before you, Lord. We thank you for guiding us into your home, Lord, for another Sunday morning where we can come partake of the Eucharist, Lord. Be one with you, Lord. So I ask that, that that oneness continue. I ask that your spirit fill this upper room, Lord, that, uh, that you speak loudly, that you give us personal application, Lord, because today is a sensitive topic, Lord. It's going to be different for every single one of us here, Lord, but we need to know exactly what it is, and we need to hear it from you. So, Lord, I ask that you wrestle with hearts today, Lord. I ask that you give me the gift of prophecy, that I may deliver your word to your people. And ultimately, Lord, that you have mercy on us, that you forgive us, and that you glorify yourself. And I ask that such of our saints and our tears, here's we pray one voice, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. <coughs> Come on up, Abuna. Of course. And we don't drive a Jaguar, so we're <laughs> so we are totally safe. It is not us. <laughs> yeah. She's like, we drive a black car. It must be us. <laughs> uh, actually, yeah, I think that would be great. You can get it from the tap, Rudy. Don't trouble yourself. It sounds weird, Claudio, or is it just me? Sounds weird. It's got like a little ringing to it or like a clanginess. It's probably my fault, but. <clears throat> All righty. All right, Claudio, I'm just going to keep talking. So if you're making adjustments, hopefully you'll be able to kind of figure out what we're talking about. So, just talking. Hopefully the sound is getting better. It's not horrible though, so even if you don't figure it out, it will be fine. Uh, other question, Claudio. Um, th these TVs, they have Apple TV on them? Yeah, so if I wanted to airplay something, I'd be able to? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's fine, thank you. Um, I haven't decided yet. <laughs> I'll keep you posted. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Okay, so guys, who remember what we talked about last week? Anyone? This is always the, the, the time of the week where I keep myself very, very humble because I remember that whatever I talked about last week, no one remembers. So I'm not saying anything memorable. So does anyone remember what we talked about last week? You can give it a little bit. Boom. That's, actually, that's all I needed, Reagan. Thank you so much. That, that right there helped me more than you guys will ever, ever know, right? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So we did. We talked about, um, we talk, we talked about King David. Uh, let me do this real quick. <clears throat> so yes, last week we talked about King David. We talked about transformation. We talked about the fact that you know, um, the sun was setting on the prior king, um, Saul, um, and God went to Samuel and he basically told him, hey, like, fill your horn with oil, like, we're, we're moving on, right? And he went and he found King David um, out with the sheep, and then he used the, the boy who was the least of all of his brethren, the one that his dad didn't even see potential in him, and he used him to do huge things, um, and he ended up being just a great king. But, you know, it, what we were kind of focusing on is the fact that, like, God is the God of transformation. Like, when he, he will take you when, when you don't even see it in yourself, and he will kind of, like, pull it out of you. And, and I'll tell you, um, the reason we're going to talk about what we're going to talk about today is I think so many times we see something like that, where we see God getting involved and doing big things. And, like, God stepped in, and he took this little ruddy, bright-eyed kid, and he made him, like... He, anointed him a king over, um, over Israel. And then we see him conquer, you know, in that battle with him and Goliath. And we know that he was a great king. And we know that, you know, even today in our prayers, we still make mention of King David. And we know that he was a man after God's own heart. And all of these things, and we think, man, that's a great story. But I'm going to tell you that there's a lot of times that 
we look at like a high level of a story, but we forget that there was, there's a bunch of stuff inside that story. And, and I think I shared this with you guys before, but um, there's something about the Old Testament, right? Like, uh, again, and I say it all the time, like, we love the writings of St. Paul. We love, you know, the Gospels. We, we love all of the stuff in the New Testament. Um, but there's something about the Old Testament, right? And even specifically, like, I know I shared with you guys last week, like, the books of First and Second Samuel, right? It's a couple of my favorite books in the Bible because there's so much to relate to. When you look at the Old Testament, you see a lot of failures. You know, you see God intervening in a bunch of situations. You see a bunch of situations where you think like, this is too bad. Like, you're not going to make it out of this one. Or like, the odds are against you too much. Um, you see some big sinners and you think that, okay, well, this person's got to be like disqualified from like God being able to use them and, and all of these things. But in the Old Testament, it is just, it's, it's a story of God's glory shown through broken people, right? So I felt that since we talked about King David's transformation last week, I wanted, I wanted to touch on something, right? And specifically, 1 Samuel, you see a lot of the great virtues of David, right? You see God lay down the foundation for just a great king, right? His interactions with Saul and how he wouldn't touch the, the Lord's anointed, right? Um, the, the way that like God was just with him and he was with God. Um, it's beautiful. And then in 2 Samuel, we see a side of King David that kind of no one would ever expect. It, you wouldn't have seen it coming from like 1 Samuel. You know, in 1 Samuel 13, that's where, where God said that this is a man after my own heart. So he's setting the stage basically saying that like, man, there's something about him. Right? But I'll tell you now, when we talk about King David today, like the second Samuel King David, what is one thing that everyone remembers? Bathsheba. Bathsheba. Right? If, if you've got people that don't know anything about King David, they don't know about the fact that he was a little shepherd boy. They don't know that he was anointed in front of his brothers and that even his dad, Jesse, didn't care about, or I don't want to say didn't care about him, but didn't see the potential inside of him. Right? Everyone knows about Bathsheba. Right? So the question is, is how did this man after God's own heart, you know, and that was God who said it. It wasn't someone who mislabeled him, right? That was God who said it, turn into an adulterer and a murderer. You know, and I was thinking about the story and it reminded me kind of like uh, something back in my early childhood, right? Because, you know, I remember in second grade specifically, okay, they took the whole class to like the gym and they would go and they would have you line up and you would take a vision test, right? And you'd go take your vision test and then some kids went to like one line and some kids went to the other line, okay? And I specifically remember I went to the other line, right? And, um, and I was just kind of like, well, what's going on here, right? Like, what's up? This, this must be the special line because like, you know, it's a shorter line and maybe I have like really, really good vision and they want to like, but that was a day that I learned that I needed glasses. Right? So, lo and behold, I was a little second grader that was running around like little glasses on. Um, <clears throat> but it's crazy though, because one of the things that I didn't see coming was, as a little second grader, I got glasses, right? But every single year, what would happen? Right? The, the vision would get a little worse, and my glasses would get a little thicker, and every single year as it kind of went on. And, and I don't think we realize how important our vision is to us sometimes. Okay, because um, it allows us to see things close up, which is kind of a big deal, right? Um, in my case, I was nearsighted, so my problem was seeing things coming from a distance, right? The stuff that was way off on the horizon was really, really hard for me, right? Vision also allows us to communicate with other people when we're face to face. It allows us to pick up on people's body language to kind of be able to get like the deeper meanings of things, right? And unfortunately, we don't realize how important our vision is until we start losing it. And then even when we start losing it, we realize that we're losing it in a very, very slow fade. So, um, that's one, pro one problem that you can have with vision, right? I'll tell you, there's this whole other problem that you can have with vision. And it's that people who have 20-20 vision, perfect vision, can also have selective blindness, where they can see almost everything, right? Um, and every single one of us has this. No one's exempt from it. Have you ever tried proofreading your own paper? Right? And then you proofread your own paper. You're like, all right, this looks good. 
right? So then you give it to like, you know, if, uh, usually at work, if I'm going to send out an email that's got like a couple people like <laughs> in the recipient line, I'll always get a second set of eyes, right? So, and of course, just because I have low self-esteem already, I'll print it out, I'll read my email, I'm like, okay, look, this is bulletproof, right? And then I'll go and I'll give it to like maybe like my assistant or something and then they'll be like, Pete, did you even read this? And I'm like, don't judge me, okay? It's, this is selective blindness, okay? <laughs> like it happens to all of us, right? But it's amazing because when you are reading something that you've done, on your, you tend to see what you want to see, right? Like even your mind, your mind will start, you know, putting commas in where the commas should be or if you got like a word in the wrong spot because you know what you should be seeing, your mind automatically just kind of sees it, right? And I just think it's ironic, right? Because we spend so many t times, you know, so much time thinking about ourselves, our needs, our wants, and at the same time, we are totally blind, or not totally, but we miss a lot of our faults. Just completely miss it, right? And I think we all have that person in our life, right? It's that person that is quick to point out the problems with everybody else's life, right? They'll be able to say, oh, yeah, no, no, they missed that. Oh, they did that wrong. Right? And the ironic part, and we all know this person, right? Because that person is sitting here being so judgmental about other people's life when their life is a hot mess. Right? Like we all know that person, right? Quick to focus on the flaws of others and a ton of a justification for their own life. Now, I will tell you, in my life, that person is me. Okay? <laughs> you thought, yeah, I'm not that brave. Um, but really, every single one of us. Right? It's every single one of us does that. Right? And Christ convicts every single one of us when he says the verse, why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but you do not consider the plank in your own? How can you say to your brother, let me remo remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye. And I'll be honest, and if you were honest too, when we think of that verse, who are we always thinking about? Someone else. Like, honestly, when I, like, myself, when I'm reading through it, I'm like, dude, that so reminds me of, like, this person or that person always doing this, always doing that. But one of the things we need to remember 100% of the time is when you are reading your Bible, who is God speaking to? You. Period. 100% of the time. And if you were reading something and God is saying, oh, you see that verse? That's for so-and-so. You know, I'll tell you, a lot of the times I don't think that that's God. Right? But I'm going to tell you, even if you do think that that's God, you can say, God, I'm going to put that on the shelf right now. Can right now, can you just talk to me? Because when we are, that, that is how God sanctifies us, right? That he sanctifies us with the washing of his word, right? So you see, going back to King David, King David was a good king, right? In 1 Kings 15, 5, it's even said about him. It says, David did was right, what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And he did not turn aside from anything that he was commanded and, uh, all the days of his life, except in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. So that's, that's tough, right? Because now you're getting King David, his whole life basically summed up in the like 1 Kings 15, 5. And he's basically saying that he was a man of God. Like, he did everything right. Whatever God told him to do, he did it with the exception of Uriah the Hittite. So he says, okay, well, what's the matter of Uriah? Well, Uriah was a good man, right? And like we kind of alluded to earlier, he was connected to Bathsheba. Right? The thing about Uriah is that he was a man of virtue in the Bible. But King David didn't treat him that way. You see, because King David slept with his wife, and that had him killed in order to try to, co to cover it up, because that was Bathsheba's husband. You know, how did the man who was righteous before God, right, the man whose heart was after God's own heart, this was the man who his enemy you know, the person who was trying to kill him was chasing him for years and he had an opportunity to harm him and he says, I can't do it. Like, I can't do it. Um, like, he was faithful in that situation with King Saul, that he didn't harm him at all, even though that he was tracking him down trying to kill him, right? He was a loyal servant. And I say, how did this man turn into the murder of Uriah the Hittite? And my, and my question, it was, it was a slow fade right? Like he, he was losing his vision little by little by little, and it was a slow fade because it always comes back to vision, right? And I'll tell you, when my vision was getting worse, right, um, I didn't even notice. And I still remember so clear, right? Like, you know, when you get glasses, you go back to your eye doctor every year, 
right? And I remember I'd kind of strut in there, and I'd go and I'd sit in the chair, I'd answer all of the questions, and I was so confident, and then he would be like, all right, cool, your, your, your prescription got a little bit worse. And I'm like, what? Like, no, I can see perfectly, right? And then I would wait, and they'd give me my new glasses, and I'd put it on, and I'm like, dude, this is a whole new world. Because I didn't even realize what I didn't see. Right? It reminds me of a story. I remember when I was 18, I used to work at Bank of America. And I worked with this girl. And I remember Bank of America had this really, really crazy policy where um, it was, you could be out of balance $25 a day, and it was considered like a marginal error. Right? Like they, it didn't get recorded, it, no one cared, you know, whatever. And I remember the first Saturday I worked, right? So uh, I was working on the teller line. And the girl basically said, oh, cool. I wonder what I want to have for lunch today, right? And she basically decided, I think she was going to have, I don't know what it was, Burger King, El Pollo Loco, whatever. Just basically took 10 bucks from her drawer and, you know, went and grabbed lunch. And I was kind of like, that's interesting, <laughs> right? Um, and it started off, you know, I would just notice it'd be $5 here, $10 here, right? And she's like, you know, what's the harm? You know, we get 25, it's never going to go against us, right? And I, I worked at B of A for a little over a year. And before I knew it, this girl was taking you know, anywhere between 80 to $100 a shift. Like, it was escalating. And when you talk to her, she did not even see it as an issue. Like, at all. Right? Because she was justifying it about how hard she works, how she's underpaid, uh, how she's worth so much more. And I will tell you, in this girl's life, when it started getting to 5 to $10 to 80 to $100 a shift, do you know what that was? That was just a slow fade. It was just a slow fade, right? And I think that's what's going on in King David's life as well. Right? Because how do you get from here to here? Right? It just doesn't make any sense. And I'll tell you, there's a couple issues in his life um, at the time that this all kind of went down. So in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 11, verse 1, it said, It happened in the spring of the year at the time when the kings go out to battle. Right? So the kings would typically go out to battle. That David sent Joab, his servant, with them and all of Israel. And they destroyed the people of uh, Ammon and besieged Rabbah. And David remained at Jerusalem, right? So where, where were the kings all? Battle. What did David do? He delegated out of his responsibility, and he sat at home. Now, and I'll tell you, when I go back and I read this, the thing that comes to mind is, wasn't David a warrior? Like, if you go back and you look at the life of David, like, isn't, wasn't that his claim of fame? Right? That's what he did really, really well. That's almost like what God kind of created him to do a little bit where like it is where God showed up in his life that was where he had purpose and that's where he, all of his victories were were on the battlefield and there's a certain point when we are not leave it, living what God has created us to do that that's where you're going to find a problem God did not create David to sit at home and relax while the troop was at war right so he took his eye off of his purpose and his calling and what like where God showed up in his life and he he got a little lazy Right? David got lazy. He didn't go out to war. Right? And I'm going to tell you guys something. God created every single one of us for a reason. And I know that there's aspects of our life, right? There's gifts and talents that he's put inside of us that we know when we're using them from his glory that life is different. Like we're in our sweet spot and we feel the presence of God and we know that this is what we were created to do. So my question is, is are you guys doing that? Are you guys using the gifts and talents that God has given you for his purpose? Because when you do, that's where God shows up. And when you don't, then you're guilty of exactly what King David's guilty of here. Right? And, you, and, and, and it doesn't end well for him. Right? Because when David didn't find himself doing that, he found himself with a huge problem. Because, ironically, he should have been out of battle with his men. And because he wasn't there... What did he find? He find one of his warriors, one of his men. His wife was bathing. And he invited her over. And then he did things that he shouldn't have done with her. And then she got pregnant. And then he tried covering it up. Right? And then in an effort to cover it up, he killed uh, when he ended up killing Uriah. And the problem is, is this was all just one bad decision. It all started with one bad decision. And we realize that it happens all of the time, right? And you, never in a million years when David was on the rooftop, uh, the rooftop looking over and, and he saw Bathsheba, never did he think that this was going to end up costing Uriah's life. 
that itself would have been enough to stop him cold in his tracks. But the reality of it is, is how many situations do we, fall ourselves, or we find ourselves into because we make a bad decision and then we cover it. Or, sorry, I don't even want to say we cover it. I want to say we attempt to cover it. And the situation gets a little bit worse and we attempt to cover it. Attempt to cover it. And the next thing you know, it's this whole natural progression and, you know, it all ends up that it all falls apart. Because it's just a slow fade. Right? One thing to another to another. Right? It reminds me of someone that I grew up with. And this friend had probably the worst eyesight that I have ever seen, okay? Um, and it's not the problem that he had bad eyesight. I had bad eyesight too, but this friend had bad eyesight but refused to wear glasses or contacts or anything that would correct his issue, okay? And it was horrible because whenever we were driving anywhere, right, especially at night, he'd be like, oh, we have to make a right on this certain street. And keep in mind, I'm old, so this is back before there was GPS and your car telling you in quarter of a mile you have to this and that and all this other stuff. So all I remember is I wasn't ever really paying attention. And all I remember is we'd be driving. He's like, oh, I got to make a right on. <laughs> I remember the street, but I don't want to say it because that would, it would lead to who it is. Let's just say, you know, Lemon, right? So he said, I'm going to make a right on Lemon, right? So we're driving, and then, you know, I'm not paying attention. And then all I know is <laughs> that was Lemon. <laughs> I was like, dude, you're killing me, man. <laughs> like, now we got to lie. Because he couldn't see the lot. He, he couldn't see it, right? When he, when he read from a piece of paper, right? Huh? Yeah, <laughs> it wasn't your brother. Um, but I also remember that, like, you know, whenever he would read a piece of paper, he'd read it like this. And I was like, dude, you're killing me, man. Like, dude, if you don't want glasses, go get contacts. Like, like work with it, right? The problem is, is he, he thought, like, nah, like, I'm good. Like, I'm good. Like, I don't, I don't need them. And the problem is, is everyone else knew that he needed them, but he himself didn't know that he needed them. Right? And I feel like a lot of the times that's kind of how we live our lives a little bit. Because we think that, like, I do a great job at covering my weakness. Like, I do a great job. Like, no one, no one can tell. Right? Like, this is just between me and me. But in reality, who are we kidding? Right? Because we're attempting to cover something that everybody around us knows exists. It's clear as day to everybody around us. But we think that we've done a great job. You know, and I remember someone, and I was talking to someone who was losing everything, right? He had put himself in a, in a, in a, in a number of situations that were not wise, right? He, he lost his wife, his family, you know, because he let a relationship get the best of him. I remember talking to this guy, and at this point, you know, at this point, the guy was broken and in tears, right? Because that's usually when it hits, right? It doesn't hit during, right? Like the consequence of your sin never hits during, it hits after. Right? And I was talking to this guy, and I'm like, man, what, what happened? Right? Um, and he was trying to wrap his mind around the, the, the cost of everything that it just cost him. Right? And he was kind of taken back. And he says, you know, I don't know. It started, it started so small. It started so small. Maybe a little flirting here and there. You know, m maybe we hung out, and then one thing kind of led to another. You know, and I never would have thought that it would have gotten here. Right? And I'm telling you, what happened in that situation is just the guy just lost his vision a little bit, a little bit at a time, right? It was getting worse and worse and worse, and he didn't even see it, and he was allowing it, and it was just a slow fade. See, because the problem is, is God will send you a wake-up call every single time, always send you a wake-up call, right? But when our vision is blurry and we are not seeing our sin for what it is, God will do something dramatic to kind of wake you up at it. See, for, for King David, you know, when Bathsheba came back to him and she said, hey, I'm with child, right? That could have been a wake-up call for King David, but it wasn't, okay? The first thing he started to do, and I think we can all relate to this, he says, okay, look, all right, I understand this is bad. I can cover it up. I can cover it up, okay? Um, so he brought back Uriah. He brought her back from war, and he says, look, he got him nice and drunk, and he said, hey, go back, Right? Go, go back home, you know, and, and, and spend the night at home, but we both knew what he was trying to get him to do with his wife. Um, but the heartbreaking part was Uriah was too loyal, right? Because he basically told King David, he says, all my brothers are out at war, right? They're all sleeping on the floor in tents in the cold. How do you expect me to go home to my wife? This is ironic because isn't that exactly what David did? King David didn't care where his men were. King David didn't care they were sleeping on the floor. 
King David, dude, King David didn't care about any of them. Matter of fact, King David slept with one of their wives, right? That had to have been another wake-up call, right? Had to have been another wake-up call. Um, <clears throat> and that, that was an opportunity where his vision could have been corrected. So my question is, is right now, do any of us have anything in our life right now where God is yelling at us, basically saying, dude, what's going on here? Is there an aspect of your life where God is saying, like, this is your wake-up call, right? It could be a relationship that, that you're in that, you know, maybe you're making some compromises. It could be lust. It could be drinking. It could be, it could be a million things, right? But really, in reality of it, it's something where God's looking at an aspect of your life and basically saying, what's going on there? Like, you need to wake up from that. You can't have that anymore, right? Honestly, you know, like I mentioned, a bunch of them, maybe it's just plain laziness, right? That there are so many attacks from Satan these days, and I just know that, God, that, that God's rooting for you, but unfortunately, I know that Satan's winning a lot of these because we don't want to wake up. But the reality of it is, is God will wake you up. He's more than willing to wake you up, right? He will correct your vision. And I love the way that God wakes up King David, right? It's a great story. And, one, and I'll be honest with you, my firstborn, you guys know that his name is Nathaniel. I originally wanted to name him Nathan based off of this story alone. Because he sends Nathan, the prophet, to go to King David. And he tells him this story. He says, there's a wealthy man with a bunch of livestock. And his neighbors, um, and his, he's neighbors with a man who's poor. And he has one lamb. And the lamb grew up with his kids ate from their food, drank from his cup, and slept in his arms. And the wealthy man had a visitor, and he refused to touch any of his own livestock. So he took the lamb that belonged to the neighbor, the poor neighbor, who loved his lamb, and slaughtered it. And I think this is such a beautiful way for God to get his attention. Because it says that when King David heard this, he was enraged. Okay? He, he was so upset, and he spouts off. He says, as the Lord lives... The man who has done this shall surely die. Imagine that, right? Just the passion that King David has for how this man was violated. And it's easy for us to just compare the person that we hear about, right? It's easy for us to hear a situation. You say, dude, that is so wrong. That, and I'll tell you, just to, to laugh at myself here, I remember when I was at Wells Fargo Bank, right? And I was, on the, you know, I was doing new accounts and all that other stuff. Um, we would have people... All the time, walking in, and the most popular request you would get was, hey, man, can you reverse my overdraft fees? Okay? And the thing that I, I, yeah, and the thing that I used to always tell them was, we only reverse them for bank error, and we'd always tell them no. Okay? We only reverse them for bank error. And then the, the, the Zinger follow-up line was the best way to not get overdraft fees on your account was, don't overdraw your account. Right? Like, it was like Captain Obvious, right? But um, it was just one of those things. But then... In the very, 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 very rare occasion that was extremely limited that I would ever get an overdraft account, what do you think I would do? I'd go to my buddies. I'd be like, hey, man, I got hit with an overdraft fee last night. Can you take care of it for me? Yeah, he would take care of it, and it would, be, it would just go on, right? And I just thought it was funny, right? Because justice for them, mercy for me, right? Like, I always had a great reason. I would tell my buddy, oh, see, because... See, what happened was, right, and then I had a great reason on, like, well, how, how I found myself in this situation, and, and it totally should be reversed. But for other people, no, 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 no. Like, that's just wrong. No justification, right? And I thank God that he is way more merciful than we are. Because when you look at King David's statement, he says, I deserve to die. That's basically what his statement meant, right? Like, I, I deserve to die, Right? And God should have said, yes, you do. You do. Like, that story was perfectly catered to you. You are the king. You have concubines. You have wives. You have all of this other stuff. And because you were bored one night, and, one, and something you already had wasn't enough for you, you had to go take someone else's little lamb. You do deserve to die, right? And a God who, who should look at him and say, you deserve to die, I love a God who instead looks at him, he says, I have grace for you. I have grace for that. Do you deserve to die? 100%. But I have grace for that. Right? And, and, and as if, like, the grace in itself isn't enough. Because we all know that, like, without his grace, we're, we're in a bad place. Right? 
And it's, it's, it's important for us to also know that he offers us that grace every single day, every single morning when we wake up, all of his, his mercies are renewed, right? And he offers us that grace and it comes with us having to kind of step out and accept it and to confess it and to repent it. But he's got grace for anything that you've done. But, and as if that's not even enough, listen to the response that he says to King David. And honestly, this, it floors me. He says, I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping. And I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if this would have been too little, I also would have given you much more. I don't, I don't even know what to say to that. I don't know what to say to that. He says, if I didn't give you enough, like, why didn't you come? I would have given you more. Like, I want to give you everything. I want to give you all this, everything that you need. Right? Why didn't you come to me? Right? God is dying. Actually, God died to give us everything that we need. But we still look for fulfillment and satisfaction elsewhere. And that's what gets us in trouble. Right? But he's dying to give us everything that we need. And if we have an unmet need, we have to take it to Christ. He's the only place where we will find it. He's the only place that will have fulfillment, only place we'll have completion, only place we'll have satisfaction. We have to stop trying to satisfy ourselves the way that King David did. So today what I want us all to think about is how is your vision today? How are you seeing today? Are there aspects of your life where you've been having a slow fade, maybe some blind spots, right? Something that's a little bit blurry. Are there aspects of your life right now where you're kind of thinking about it and you're just wondering, how did I get here? Like, how did I get here? <clears throat> and even though that's an important question, we need to ask it, right? I'll also tell you on the other side of it, who cares, right? Like, you are there. How do you get out of there is the more important question. How do you free yourself from that? You know, it says that Nathan didn't conf uh, confront King David until roughly a year after everything happened. Because sometimes we can live in stuff in the dark. David lived with that stuff at least a year in the dark. And I'm going to be honest with you, sometimes it, it, it is a year. Sometimes things get bad very, very quickly, right? So a lot of times I might say it took King David a year and you guys are like, all right, cool. So I got a year? No, man. Like it could be a minute. It could be an hour. No one knows when that darkness is going to come to light the way it did here. Right? But I will tell you this. The only promise is if you continue to keep it in the darkness, it will continue to get worse every single time. So let today be a day of light. Bring your weakness into the light and it will be the first step of you overcoming it and being set free from it. So if you have aspects of, of darkness in your life right now, then I encourage you to have somebody, your confession father, a spiritual father, a mentor, a friend, someone who's spiritually mature, to bring that stuff to light. Because I will tell you that that, that year in King David's life, even if you go back to the Psalms, it was a dark year. It was a very dark year. So we need to, to, to get in the light. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Let's stand up and pray. <clears throat> in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Lord, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for the lessons that you give us in your word. So, for, especially in the, in the story of King David, Lord, who he was such a great man, Lord. He did so many things right for you, your nation. It's such a pure heart for you, Lord, and a heart that's offered a repentance that none of us have even stepped up into, Lord. But Lord, he also was a man of flaws and a man of mistakes and a man of lessons, Lord. So Lord, I ask that you allow us to learn from him, Lord, so that we don't fall into those same things. For Lord, I know that you are a big God who is calling us into you, Lord. I know that you are a God who wants to be a God of light of every aspect of our life, Lord. And I ask that you just shine that light on us, Lord. Lord, help us find healing for anywhere that we need it, Lord, for I know that we have wounds. 
But Lord, ultimately, I just ask that you just allow, just teach us, Lord, how to just hand it all over to you. How to trust you, how to come to you, how to bring our unmet needs to you, Lord. Because just like you, you, you told King David, Lord, I know that you are willing to meet us there as well. I ask that you, that you bless this group, Lord. I ask that you bring them back next week, Lord. That you bless our time from now until then, Lord, and that this is not the only time we spend in your presence, but that we step into it every single day. I ask in the session of our saints and martyrs, here's we pray one voice saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, by the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever.